Now I see it up in the top left corner for Zoom. How long does it take to refresh? Got it. There it is. Oh, wow. look at the delay. Awesome. Wow. I don't see it. It came up and it's recording from back 30 seconds ago. What do I what do I type in? Wow. On my Facebook. Came up and it's recording from back 30 seconds ago. Awesome guys. Well, thank you so much for joining. For those of you who have joined. My name is Chris Arretchadero. I'm the Assistant Director for Coastal Conservation Association in California. We also have Mr. Wayne Cotto, Executive Director for Coastal Conservation Association in California. And we have Mr. Dave Hansen live with us. Welcome, Dave. Woo! Here we go, gang. Get ready. Put on your seatbelts. <laughs> How are you Hope doing today? I see six people on. All right. Well, all six of them better get ready. <laughs> it's Here we go. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be Oh, awesome. yeah. I think it is. Awesome. Well, we could pause just a little bit, let people kind of join in here. But how are you doing, Dave? What's going? What's new in your life, and uh, how have you been uh, surviving during this quarantine? Well, we're down here in beautiful Cabo San Lucas. There has been zero rioting, so we're pretty happy about that. We are still on lockdown. They just told us this morning that we're in a red light so that means that we are totally locked down we can't go out on the ocean we can't go to the beach we kind of are where you guys were a month ago we're right there and we've been closed for two and a half months down here so i don't know what the answer is it's kind of weird right now they canceled a bunch of flights next week that were supposed to be coming down here but they keep telling us that they're going to tell us tomorrow and we keep waiting for tomorrow and tomorrow never seems to come Gotcha. Gotcha. So let's say hi to a few people. We got Don and Don Walter Davis on board. We got Robert Grubber. We got uh, Brad and uh, David Chavez signed in. Just so you guys know, we're trying something new here. We're on a Zoom feed that we're then putting into our live Facebook feed. It seems to be delayed by 20 or 30 seconds to the feed, just so you know. Um, well, John Lou's on board, Scott Manson's on board, Arnie's on. Thank you guys for coming in and watching us. So go, okay. Awesome. Yeah. Woo, here we go. Looking good. Looking good. This is working. We're moving right along here. We're going to start loading up people here. Everyone's starting to come in. Excellent. Excellent. Well, we're all excited to hear from you, Dave, as well. But we also do have something very, very important to talk about, don't we, Wayne? Yes, we do. So, hey, so while we have a few people coming on board, we've got some uh, very important legislation being uh, passed through Sacramento right now, AB 3030. And what that stands for is 30% uh, by 2030. What they are trying to do is pass legislation to uh, protect land, ocean, and uh, water. So it's it's all of California, right? The land, the fresh water, and the ocean. They want to try to protect 30% by 2030. So we penned the phrase for us on the ocean side. We penned it MLPA 2.0. This is important, guys. We need everybody to get behind us, help CCA to defeat this legislation. This is important. It's not just fishing. It is all land. It could be hunting, it could be freshwater fishing, it could be lakes, streams, 30% in California by 2030. This, they cannot define what protection means. They cannot tell you what they're trying to protect. Very, very broad legislation. They say they're gonna to try to protect biodiversity, sea level rise, climate change, but they don't have any meat in the bill on how they wanna do it other than they wanna protect the water, the land and the, and the fresh water but there's nothing on how they're going to accomplish their goals. And that's the scary part. They claim that they're not against hunting and fishing, but they refuse to put that in their bill. And we know what happens. We went through MP MLPA. We've gone through the National Marine Sanctuaries. We know what happens when it's not spelled out. They lie. And this is what they're doing right now to us. They claim that they're going to try to put it in, but they have yet to do it. So we have to oppose this legislation, guys. And there's no other way to go about this. It already made it through the assembly up in Sacramento, the two committees, 
It has a huge price tag on it. We're in a deficit budget. They have no way to pay for this, yet it got through appropriations in the assembly. So it's now onto the Senate. We have less than 30 days before it hits the Senate and we have to defeat this. It'll go to a committee, it'll go to an appropriations and then it'll go to the full Senate floor if it gets by those two committees. So guys, we need your help. We have a Keep America Fishing uh, campaign out there right now to, to write your senators. We have uh, other drives that we're gonna be putting together. We need all of you to reach out to your contacts, your fishing clubs, your tackle stores, your manufacturers that you know, boats, landings, it doesn't matter. It doesn't even have to be in the fishing industry because we're building a huge coalition. We need approval to for every group to sign on to one of our coalition letters. You need to send those logos and approvals to Chris Arechadera here, and he will uh, consolidate them for us, okay? We've already started, started that part of that campaign while we were in the assembly. We need to complete that action. We need to fight to get rid of this bill, okay? It, it's, it's very, very important. Um, Chris, have you seen any questions come up regarding it? I haven't been watching, sorry. Um, no questions quite yet, but uh, right. everyone's still saying hi and chiming in. Um, yeah. Also guys, just as a call to action, what Wayne is saying is very, very important and very, very serious for us. All that call to action, all of the ways to contact your Senator, all the ways to join CCA, all that's actually on our homepage at ccacalifornia.org. Um, so it's very, very important. Now is the best time to really get involved with CCA Cal um, on defeating this legislation and also just to you know, get together, trying to help defeat this, uh, defeat AB 3030. So while we're, while we're uh, on the subject of things that we're doing, right? We're trying to defeat this major legislation right here in, in California. We're trying to defeat the uh, proposal for the National Marine Sanctuary up in Chumash, up in Northern, uh, Central California. We're working on uh, trying to get everybody open because everybody's still not open up and down the state, right? All the sport boats we worked on, the piers, the, the landings, uh, the, uh, the lakes, the, the beaches, we've, marinas, we worked on all of that to help get that opened over time. Let's try to make sure that we follow along social distancing guidelines, health guidelines, so we can keep it open. Um, and the fishing has been great, so let's let's just keep running. So, and we got a few things going on, right, Chris? We got the uh, day on the bay with CCA uh, Saturday, this Saturday down in Mission Bay. You can go to our website and see that. Also, uh, we got the Mylar Summer Pickup, uh, which is a great campaign that we're going to parlay all the way through November. So, you guys go to our website, follow us on Facebook, like us on Instagram, and treat, please go support this uh, opposition to AB thirty thirty. Yeah. And at the very least, guys, if you are unsure of how you can help, whether it's financially, whether it's joining, um, anything at all, maybe you have a couple contacts that you would like to, us to get, uh, get in contact with. At the very least, just hit the contact us button on our website and get a hold of us. That's the best thing you can do. And, if, and that's for anyone who is willing to help, wants to help, but maybe not quite sure how to help. Just please contact us, reach out to us. And we can sure use you for sure. All right. Without further ado, your saltwater guide, Mr. Dan Hanson. All right, gang. Thanks, Wayne. Thanks, Chris. Guys, we're going to do something that we normally, we, I usually just get on Facebook and talk and talk and talk and talk. Tonight, we're going to try it a little different way. I got Chris kind of watching the questions. He's going to let us know what you guys are asking. And I'm gonna do a Q and A here, but first of all, I'm gonna babble for a few minutes. So don't all jump off of here because you might wanna to listen to what I have to say. This is super important. This is super important to my family and it should be very, very important to your family that this does not go through. They crammed that MLPA Wayne, myself, my family, a lot of us went to a phenomenal amount of meetings. And then they came along and they took away a lot of the California coastline. Some of the most beautiful places on the planet were taken away from us. Laguna Beach, California, one of the most diverse fisheries in Southern California. We're not even allowed to go there anymore and fish. And once this is gone, gang, it's gone forever. 
I want you all to understand what I'm talking about when I say forever. My grandkids can't go there. My little grandson, he can't go fish Laguna. Laguna's where I grew up fishing. Laguna, a lot of us fished off the rocks there when we were kids. Laguna is beautiful and it was gone. Think of, think about Mammoth and think about the, the Owens and think about Mono County and think about all those places you trout fished, even if you don't like saltwater fishing, where you went, we are at a big time risk of losing all those beautiful places to take our children and our grandchildren and go fish and introduce them to fishing and introduce them to the outdoors. All that's going to go away. We all need to let as many people know about this AB 3030 because it's not going to be good for us. And CCA has a link right to it. Make sure you go, you read what you're talking about, send letters, call, do whatever you can because with what all the stuff that's going on in the world right now, this is one they can sneak right through. And as soon as I found out about it, I've been sounding the alarm for two days on my Facebook live feeds. And I'm telling you, this is important. Yeah. So enough of the political garbage, right, Chris? Actually, one one question just came in okay. um, by the San Diego Anglers, actually. What's the current estimate of land and water consumed by current MLPAs? Um, the question or the answer to that question, I believe, is about 16 percent already. This bill is asking for a, for 30 percent. So that kind of gives you in perspective what we've already lost in the past versus what they're asking for now. So I just wanted to uh, answer that question, but go for it, Dave. All right. That was a good question, though. We need to know that gives you some type of an idea of how big this is, because when we think 30 percent. Oh, that I don't know. We could no, we can't handle that. We don't want to handle that. We don't want to see what that looks like when it happens, gang, because it's not going to benefit us. But like I said, I'm done on the soapbox. I'm coming off now. It's comedy time. It's time to go catch some fish. It's time for what most of you came here to listen to me. Those of you that have never listened to me, welcome. It's like no seminar you've ever seen or heard before in your life. Those of you that have seen it, that's why you're here. Those of you that haven't, I will be as entertaining as I am live on this, I promise. So we're going to talk about this fish that has decided to make Southern California its home. These bluefin tuna. Now, I talked to Paul Hebert on Wicked Tuna. We talk to each other a lot. And he always laughs when we call these things giant bluefin. Most of them that we call giants, they're not even allowed to keep back there. So... You got to put it in perspective. For us in Southern California, a 70 pound bluefin and above, that's a giant for us. And this stuff won't leave. It's decided that it likes Southern California. It likes to come here. It really has decided that it loves to go to your house and spend the evening with you and enjoy dinner with you. And so it's, I'm going to try to help you to take those tuna to your house because that's where they, first of all, they want to go in that white bag, the one with the ice in it. They want to get in that bag because that water has been super warm the last few years and they're sick of swimming in that warm water. And there was about a month there where they thought that all the humans had died because no one was out there and they were pissed. Now they're doing everything they possibly can to get into that white bag with the ice in it. And then this, it's a simple, simple transition from the white bag to your house, to your table. And then they're there at your house having dinner with you. So we're going to try to help you put those fish in your living room. So the key to this bluefin thing is to figure out where they're going. The last thing you want to do is try to go where they've been. You always want to try to figure out where they're going. One of the tricks that I use is I go over to Fish Dope and I go to their terrafin chart, I go to their chlorophyll chart, and I look at the fish symbols that they have on their chart, and I look at the water that the fish were caught in today, because they keep a track of where everyone's catching their fish, and then I look at that water and I try to figure out which way that water's moving, and then I make my game plans for the next day according to the way the water is moving. Now, 
if you can figure out where they're headed, it's way better than getting into where all the boats are first thing in the morning. It sucks to be right there with 300 boats in the morning. But if you can get to the upper edge of where that fish is headed, and then if you don't find it, you can slowly work back into the area where everybody's at. But by then, you probably have figured out because you listen to the radio if they're there or not, because you're going to hear some people on the radio telling you, oh, I'm hooked up. Oh, I'm hooked up. But remember, like I say all the time, don't fish by the radio. You don't want to use your radio to try to catch fish. You want to use what you got up here. You want to use your eyes and you want to gather as much information as you can before you go out there and spend a thousand dollars on bait, fuel, time off of work, hooks, line, the whole thing. You want to gather as much information as you can. There's a three places to gather information to be hot on the spot to catch these bluefin. You can go to Billy Kay's website. You can go over to Fish Dope. Those two are great websites. Or you can go to YourSaltWaterGuide.com where I'm giving you all the information right there on my website. But you got to have information. I don't care who you think you are and how good you think you are. You're getting your information before you leave on a trip from somebody. Somebody is telling you where those fish are biting at. Now, if you're only using the AIS, you're going to where they bit yesterday. But you want to go chlorophyll, terrafin, get an informational base website, mine, Billy's, Fish Dope, all three of them if you can afford it. I mean, mine's super expensive. Mine costs $4.99 a month. So that might be a little pricey for mine. I think Billy charges like $1,200 a minute or something on his. And then over there at Fish Dope, you get all the information for $169 a year. But I'm just telling you guys, it's super important to know where you're going when you get out there and you got to stick to the plan. When you go to the website, any of the websites, or you talk to your buddies at the plumbing store, or at the hardware store, and you guys figure out a plan, when you get out there, make sure you stick with the plan and don't start fishing for boats. The biggest problem I see in my guide service for the last 30 years Everybody on the boat is always looking at the other boats that are stopped. I hear this all day, every day. Hey, Captain Dave, is that boat over there stopped? Now you've taken whoever's looking for fish out of there looking for fish mode. Now he's looking over at the boat, which I don't even understand why we're worried about if that other boat stopped. But now I'm looking at that boat. You're looking at that boat. Your friend's looking at that boat. None of us are looking for fish. And now we're all trying to figure out if that boat over there is stopped. For goodness sakes, gang, when it's your day to go fishing, go fishing for fish, quit looking for boats. Now we're going to talk. Now we're out there and we have a plan and we're going to talk about how to execute our plan. We want to take our fish finding apparatus, our fatometer, if you will. We want to set it the top at zero and the lowest depth you want to look at on your private boat is probably 300 feet. If you're on a larger type of yacht, maybe you want to look down as far as 400 feet, but I wouldn't look much past that. The biggest problem I see most people make when they're using their fish finding apparatus, their photometer, is they leave it on auto. And that's going to kill you. Because if you leave it on auto, where we're looking for this giant bluefin is in 3,000 feet of water. So your little fish finder is bouncing off the surface, going all the way down to 3,000 feet, bouncing back up. If you run over a school of 200 pound bluefin, let's say there's 400 of them in the school and your pedometer is going zero, zero to 3,000 feet, guess what? You're barely gonna see those giant bluefin. They're gonna look like the hair on my head if you can see that. That's what it's gonna look like on your screen. You want to stretch that screen out so you're looking zero to 400 feet. We're not so worried about those fish below 400 feet because they don't want to get in the white bag. The ones from zero to 400 feet, they are trying to figure out what they have to eat to get in the white bag. And they're all swimming around, looking up at the surface, waiting for food to fall out of the sky. And that's where we come in. So. 
Once we've located them on the fish finding apparatus, we're going to push on our GPS, we're going to push save, and we're going to save that spot where we marked the fish on our up and down machine. We're going to save that. We're going to come back around on it, and we're going to try to set the boat up on top of those fish because you should probably going to be driving. And by the time you see them, they're already behind you. Because remember, your fish finding apparatus is going straight up and straight down. You do not have a sonar unless you spent 30 or $40,000. I know they told you it was a sonar when you bought it, but it's not. They just try to put that on there to get you to buy it. If it's going straight up and straight down, that's not a sonar. That is a photometer and it's looking underneath your boat. It's not looking out on the sides. The side scanning sonar that the sport boats use and a lot of the big yachts, that is a giant investment. And it's gonna have a ram that comes out of the bottom of your boat. And it's, the end of it's gonna look like the camera at the casinos in Vegas. It's gonna be a little head that comes down through a tube, goes through the hole of your boat. And then it looks around for those tuna out around the boat. But 90% of us don't have that. We have a photometer that's looking straight underneath our boat. So the moment we mark some fish, they're already behind us. We have to turn the boat around, drive back over where we saw the X, and then we can see them. Now we can throw a little chum if we're looking at those 70, 80 pounders because they're going to eat the fly line sardines. If you start to see massive, gigantic boomerangs, those are those big fish. If you go to my website, your saltwater guide, there's pictures of them on there. Or if you go to my Facebook page, I'm always posting pictures of what it looks like on the fish finder. You're looking for those bigger boomerangs if you want to fish the flying fish. But if you're seeing the smaller boomerangs, that's going to be your 40, 50, 60, 70 pound fish, maybe that 100 pound, but most of it's going to be that smaller fish that will eat the sardines and eat the fly line mackerel. You want to get set up on it, then you want to start that slow, steady chum line, one on the corner, on the downhill corner, and that those fish are going to start to walk up your photometer. You're going to see them. You might have marked them at 300 feet. As you start drifting on them, they decide they want to live underneath your boat. And as you slowly chum, you'll see them start to climb up that pedometer. Once they get in that 100 foot or less zone, you're going to get a bite. I've seen it a billion times. When they're below 100 feet, they're looking around. They haven't quite figured it out. As you see them start to climb up your fish finder and get above 100 feet, game on. They're going to come to the surface, start boiling around. That's when they're going to hit your fly line bait. But here's the biggest thing I've seen people make this. When those fish are at, down there at 100 feet or less, they're coming to the surface to feed. If you can't get them to come up above 100 feet, if they're staying down at 200, uh, 250 feet, then you do the rubber band rig like I made that video for Bloody Decks over on uh, YouTube. You could check out that video. It's had, I don't know. 100,000 views or something, how to attach a rubber band sinker onto your line so you can drop your mackerel or your big sardine down to where those fish are. But if they're above 100 feet, I'm fly lining all day, every day. I'm not putting a weight on because here's how I figured it, how to explain it to people in my seminar. How fast can you walk 100 feet? Pretty dang fast. That fish can swim a hundred feet with two swipes of his tail and he's up the surface. And that's all, their whole job is looking up, looking for food. So their whole job is to find that food. That's why it's super important to feed them. As soon as you stop feeding them, they're gonna leave because they're gonna go look for more food. So if you hook a fish and your buddy hooks a fish and you're the only two people on the boat, one of you better be able to reach back to the bait tank every once in a while and throw one bait off that downhill slide corner every once in a while to keep those fish there. So after you catch those two, you're ready to catch your third one. Because if there's two of you, how many bluefin do you want? Four. Every single time you want your limit. The limits were set by the law. And who am I to break the law? You want to always make sure you get your limit when you go out there. I think it's silly when I hear people say, oh, you know, I only took what, what I needed. Really? Have any of your friends ever asked you, do you have any extra fish? 
You're not gonna deplete the population of fish in the ocean with one of these. A fishing pole and a piece of string and a hook. You're not that good of a fisherman. You're not gonna deplete. You're not gonna save the planet because you threw back a bluefin. You're not gonna save the planet, all right? I'm sorry, I had to go there, Chris. <laughs> It's all that's why I'm politically not correct. And I understand that. That's why they don't let me go to these council meetings and stuff. And that's okay. I'm busy enough. So that's what those smaller bluefin. Now, when you get up to that 100, 200, 300 pound fish, when you've got those fish boiling around the boat, you're going to want to send that kite out with your dead flying fish that you just spent $80 on the one flying fish that you went to the store and bought or $30. Sorry, I get all excited. 30 you spent $30 on one bait. You want to get that one fish on it. We like to fish a double rig like this, two 11 odd hooks. If you can see them, I fish a double rig. That's my zip tie for holding my, my uh, flying fish on the hook because I zip tie them onto the hook. I don't actually put the hook through the flying fish. And then we'll put one on the head and one on the tail zip tied to the flying fish and then we'll send that little baby out there on the kite and then we'll dap it on the water we'll bounce it up and down on the water and every time that thing touches the water you're less you're so excited because you know one of these times it's dapping it's going to get bit these hooks are 11 odd owner hooks offset super sharp these rigs breck at hogan's tackle makes these rigs for me this is what I use. I use these down in Cabo. The big yellow fin love to eat the flying fish down here, just like the big blue fin like to eat the flying fish up there. Why two hooks? Because this is going to make that flying fish set perfect on the water. One hook's a little bit longer because that flying fish is a little bit longer tail to head, and it's going to set there and dap on the water, and it's going to keep your flying fish straight, if that makes any sense at all. Whenever I have tuna in Southern California boiling around the boat right now, I'm always sending out my dead flying fish because those big blue fin are swimming around with the yellow fin and they're swimming around with the blue fin. And it doesn't hurt to have that one bait out there, 100 yards off the side of the boat, bouncing on the kite, bouncing in and out of the water. And then all of a sudden you hook a 250, 300 pounder. I'm putting both thumbs on the spool and breaking off that 70 pounder. And I'm over on the big rod, reeling in the big fish. It's gonna change what you catch if you try to figure all these things out and execute each and every one of them. And the best time to do it is every single time you're offshore because it's all about practicing. And the last thing you wanna do is when they do start to bite, be the very first time you've ever tried to do it, That's Sometimes that's awesome if it's your first time and man, you get a bite, but while you're trying to figure it all out, it gets kind of frustrating when the fish are biting. So I have set up a super easy way to do every single thing I'm talking to you about as far as the kite goes, rigging the flying fish, sending the kite out. I'm telling you for $4.99, you can go over there to your saltwater guide gang. And I'm sorry if you think I'm selling this, but I am because I want you all to be successful. I'm not trying to hit a home run off the website. I'm trying to make it so that you all keep fishing so that we keep this community strong. I've been giving information out for 40 years and I'm gonna keep doing it till the day I die. I don't play hide the ball. I want you all to be successful when you go. You can see the whole series. There's uh, seven parts of my kite series from how to rig it, to how to fly it, to how to bounce that flying fish out there on the water. Now, that being said, if you're out there and the wind starts to blow a little bit, now it's time to drag the rubber flying fish behind the boat. And this is a whole different technique. And this one's all about the tack. It's all about making sure that when this thing's skipping on the water, it's as far off the side of the boat as it can possibly be. How do you make it get that far out? It's about the tack. It's about which way you're driving your boat into the wind. 90% of the time in Southern California, we have a northwesterly wind. That's our prevailing wind in Southern California. So most of the time you can get away with either going zero on your compass or going 180. That's the tack. 
zero is going to kick that thing way, way, way off the starboard side. And then when you go 180, it's going to kick it way off the port side. But never, ever, when you're tacking back and forth on these bluefin, do you ever turn and go downswell with the kite out. Whenever you make a turn, you always want to be headed into the wind. Those of you that are listening right now, you know what I mean. You've done that downhill turn and your kite goes crashing into the water. And that's usually right when the boats around you get bit. It's a time thing when those bluefin decide. That's why I hate them. And I hate them. And I think they all should die. <laughs> because one day they'll bite at seven o'clock in the morning. The next day they'll bite at nine o'clock at night. So for captains like myself, it's an 18 hour day, every day fishing for those things because you don't wanna miss the morning bite. But then if you miss, if they don't bite in the morning, you don't wanna go in too early because then what happens? Then they bite late and then you don't catch them. So many, many days last year, the year before, the year before, the year before, we'd leave the dock. We'd leave the dock at Two o'clock in the morning, we run out to the butterfly or run out to the backside of Clementi, get there right at gray light, start skipping that rubber flying fish because it was windy. And we would skip that thing until nine o'clock at night. And at six o'clock at night, we didn't have a fish on the boat. And at nine o'clock at night, we had four or five 200 pounders. And that's how it goes out there, gang. And if you, if you leave the grounds at four, you go all the way out there and you spend all that money on fuel, and then you leave early and go home and then you get home and you look on fish dope or you look on, on uh, my website or Billy's website and you go, oh my gosh, they bit at 6.30 last night. You got to stay till it gets dark, gang. If you're going all the way out there for a fish of a lifetime, you have to fish from gray light to sunset. Does that make any sense at all? Okay, now I told you I was going to babble like crazy for a long time. Now we're going to open it up because... I can go back in whatever questions I get asked. I'm going to go on a rant and I might get lost and I'm going to ask Chris, pull me back in, buddy. I don't even know what I was talking about. <laughs> awesome. So, Does anybody have any questions? With that being said, if you guys have any questions at all, please put it down in the comments below. We do have one that came in a while ago from Eric. When are you coming back to California? Because he wants to jump on your boat. Okay, Eric, look. If you guys don't straighten that sh crap up up there, if you guys don't get your governor in line, I'm not coming back because it looks horrible. What are you guys doing up there? My goodness. What happened? In are you, is it going to turn into Seattle up there? Be careful. No, I'm down here. I got a really killer job. I'm working for a phenomenal person. So we're in it for the long, long haul right now. We're here till who knows when. But right now we're living in Mexico. It's super cool. It's super safe. I love it down here. It's my dream. I dreamt of living down here since I was a little kid. I used to run yachts up and down the Cabo coast. I never got to spend a lot of time here. We were always fishing. Now I've been living here for the last nine months and it is spectacular. The only problem is we're in the middle of a global pandemic and I can't go to the beach. So I'm like super pale right now. I'm hoping I can get out to the beach soon and go fishing. They won't even let us go fishing right now. That's how bad it is down here as far as lockdown. But hey, it's Cabo. It's cool. There's lots of good food. All right. Very Anything cool. else? So I do have a question. What's your take? Over the last couple of years, we've seen the, um, the comeback of the frozen flyer. A lot of guys are using the frozen flyer for many different purses. What, what's your take on it? How do you use it? What are you using it for? Tell me about it. Okay, so when I grew up, there was no uh, marlin lures in, when I was a kid. And they used to gill net flying fish at San Clemente Island. And everybody that marlin fished in Southern California trolled dead flyers. That was what they had to troll. No one had made any of these marlin. I mean, in the early 70s, they started making some marlin lures. But before that, in the 60s, everybody drugged dead flying fish behind their boat and they rigged them. Now, if we look even further back in time to the times of the Avalon Tuna Club and Farnsworth and all those guys fishing, they all were rigging these fly, dead flying fish back then and flying them on a kite. And then lo and behold, 
three years ago or something, one of the commercial guys took somebody out and they saw that he was using them. And then here we are. Now everybody's using them. It was a commercial guy's secret. He wasn't telling anybody how he was catching all the bluefin. And we would see the guy come running into areas where we were getting bit on the skip rubber flying fish. And then all of a sudden he'd come in and just deploy that dead flyer, bam, get bit instantly. And we would all sit there and scratch our heads and go, what was he doing? He looking in the binoculars, but you couldn't see because it was already eaten. The dead flying fish is candy. Everybody likes it. Giant Dorado, you guys have all seen the videos of the giant Dorado chasing those flying fish around and big schools of them flying out of the water. It's like a candy bait to these fish and all the different types of rigging we're doing now and everything. It's an evolution that actually we're going back to history and looking at it and going, hey, they were onto something back then and maybe all these old people aren't as stupid as the millennials make us out to be. Maybe all the old people aren't that dumb, but this flying fish is a candy bait, has been for years, and it's thick at San Clemente Island right now. It's thick at Catalina. And I think if you're going to spend any time offshore anywhere, up and down the California coast, the Baja coast, you've got to have some dead flyers in your freezer somewhere on your boat because it's candy. Make up some of those double trouble rigs to skip that or to run the dead flyer out on the kite also those double troubles work fishing mackerel on the kite but that flying fish gang is candy you should have some that's why they're 30 dollars a piece it's instant bite when they're out there if you drop one of those things on those foamers of bluefin you get a fish immediately it's hard to beat it and that's why it's 30 dollars plus if you've ever tried to catch them standing at the rail all night with a butterfly net it's it's a lot of work at the end of the night, you'll go, it was worth 30 bucks to buy them. Well said. Well said. This is kind of a neat one. Jeremy wants to know, do you believe in eating the heart of your first tuna? We've always said that, Jeremy, since we were kids. Everybody's done that. And uh, I know it's a luck thing. It, everyone says you have to eat that heart. It's luck. It's going to change the course of your luck fishing. So I am an advocate of it. I've always talked about it every time we've ever had anybody. Back in my day, it was the albacore because albacore was a big deal. When you took someone out to get the first albacore, you ate the hearts. That's what I grew up learning about. Someday maybe that albacore will come back. But yeah, it was eat the heart. Everybody has to eat the heart on the first fish. Don't do it to your wife and don't do it to your children because we don't want to, once we ruin the wife or the girlfriend or once we ruin the kids, they're never going. I don't care if the Wahoo are biting on the dock. Once they have a bad experience, it's over. So don't pressure your wife into eating the heart. Don't be a dummy. Don't pressure your kids into eating the heart. It's your buddies. It's, your, it's the men or the whip, you know, your, your girlfriend, your hardcore girlfriend. But man, don't try to make your wife eat the heart and then go home that night and try to figure out why she's pissed that that is well said my friend that's uh that's so true as well hey we do have a question from richard how do you identify sardine versus anchovies versus red crab on the uh pedometer? okay that's a good question now this is how i've always read it that red crab's not going to have the density on the pedometer. it's going to be more of a type of fuzz looking on your fish finder. It's gonna be more of a fuzz. The sardines, they stack up. They're, they're more of a linear, lin, linear, linear, they're more of lines, sorry, I can't use big words. But they look more like lines of bait on your fish finder where the anchovies are gonna be big giant balls. The red crabs are gonna be a, a, a layer and it's going to be more fuzzy in it, not a lot of density. Sardines are going to be stacked up in lines, if you will. Linear, linear, linear. There linear. you go. I got it. Woo, linear. So it's going to look more linear. If that may, if any of that makes sense, I think that was the question. Yeah, and you're one of the best in terms of reading your uh, reading your equipment, using your equi uh, equipment effectively. Do you have any tools out there on your website that uh, can kind of teach you the new boat owner? or the one that uh, just bought a brand new piece of expensive equipment, 
How, how, how do you read that? Well, thank you, Chris. Here's the deal. I've been blessed to be your saltwater guide for the last 30 years. So I'm on a different boat when I was in Southern California every single day. The best year I ever had, I was on 147 different boats that one year. I looked at a different machine every single day, if you can imagine that. So I got really good at honing in your machine. One day I'd be looking at a hummingbird. The next day I'd be looking at a Furuno. The next day I'd be looking at a Lowrance. It didn't matter. It's all about tuning in the game. And then it's all about taking it off of auto. That is crucial. It's going to change what you catch. That machine should never be allowed to be in charge of what you're looking at. It, there not, should not be one item on that pedometer that's set on auto. Why do people set it on auto? You know why? Because they're afraid of it. They're afraid of the machine, so they leave it on auto and they don't get to see anything. The biggest problem fishing yellowtail at Clemente or Catalina is when you have it on auto and you're fishing in 60 feet of water and you mark some fish and you turn around and you run over your air. Now the machine's looking at 3,000 feet. By the time you run back over those fish, you didn't see them because you went over your air bubble and then the machine didn't have time. Never, ever do you run it on auto. I'm going to change your lives right now, guys. Don't run it on auto. But if that still doesn't make any sense and you want to see a video, I have videos for gang. Thanks, Chris. I have a video for everything you want to do in Southern California. You name it. I made you a video and I'm making a new video every Tuesday. I drop a brand new video on the site. Site's been going for about almost three years. We have about 2000 members and if you want to know if it's real, Google my name. And if it's not real, you would see, with all the negative in the world today, you would see so much negative. But there isn't any because I don't do anything negative. Everything I tell you is the truth. The videos are there. I'm super approachable. I do about 50 seminars a year live before this virus. I did the last trade show in America. Did the Fred Hall show. I spoke three times a day there. Plus, I had my booth there. I want to help all of you to catch more fish. And it's, it's not that hard if you follow some simple directions. It's like making chocolate chip cookies. You got to follow the recipe. If you leave out one ingredient, those cookies will taste crappy. If you leave out one thing I tell you, you probably won't catch. Oh, that's a perfect analogy, man. Hey, Kent wants to know, and I'm assuming this is for the yummy, why don't you use the back treble hook? Okay. Here's what I was taught. I can only go by my success, okay? That treble hook, those hooks, they don't have, let me see. See the, the distance between the hook and the shank? On a treble hook, that's much smaller. And if he nips at it and he gets that caught in the roof of his mouth, have you ever seen the bluefin, the two or 300 pounder? The roof of their mouth has a large membrane on there that has a tendency to rip out. When this hooks them in the roof of their mouth, or this one hooks them in their belly, or they get both of them, this hook's gonna drive right into the bone on their, the roof of their mouth. This hook's gonna drive right through the bone on the bottom jaw. These are what I was taught to use by some of the guys that have been doing it longer than I've been alive. So that's why I use these. But I'm telling you, if you use treble hooks and they work, then stay with them. This is what I use. I can only show you what I use. I'm not going to show you what someone else uses because I don't use what they use. I use what I use. And I use 11 aught thick wire owner hooks. That's why. And if they, if Mustad made these big, giant, thick wired offset hooks, I'd use them because I'm sponsored by Mustad, but they don't make this offset 11 aught hook. If they did, I would use it. The reason I use owners is because they make them and they're bitching and they work. And I had a phenomenal amount of success catching these giant blue in the last five years. I don't want to change the recipe because Jimmy's friend's sister's cousin caught one with the treble hook. I'm not using it. I'm sorry. I'm going to use what works for me. And when it quits working for me, then maybe I'll look at that treble hook. Excellent. Excellent. 
And also as a, remind, a reminder, guys, if you have any questions at all for Captain Dave, please leave them in the comments below. We'll, we'll try and answer as many as possible. But we do have a question from Brad. What okay. would you give, or what would give you an edge on one of the bigger, or on one of the bigger sport boats, like on San Diego on a tuna trip? What gives you an edge? That's a great question. That is such a great question. The very, the, I ran sport boats for a long, long time. Let me tell you something. There is a whole secret to the whole thing. And I don't want to say that the captains and the crew play favorites, but we do. I mean, let's be honest. We're still just human beings on the planet Earth. And we like the people we like. And we don't like the people we don't. So when you get on that sport boat, if you act like that guy, if you get on there and you act like that guy, it will change what you catch on that boat that day. You don't want to be that guy. You want to be the guy that meshes with the crew. You want to walk up and talk to the first deck. You want to talk to him. You want to see what's going on. How's he doing? You want to get his name. You want to have a chit chat with him. When you see the captain of the boat, 90% of the captains are very approachable nowadays. You want to talk to him. Because there's only one person on that boat that knows what you're going to do today. Him. Nobody else. I don't care if you were on the boat yesterday. You have no idea what phone calls he made last night, who he talked to, what kind of deal went on at his house the night before, where his head's at when he gets on the boat. He's going where he's going. He's doing what he's going to do. He's the only one that knows. You want to talk to him, civilized, like a human being. And you want to go, hey, Skip, what's going on? How you doing? My name's Dave. Hey, I just want to know what, what's our plan? What is the plan? I want to be on the same page as you, Skip. I want to be on your page. And if you follow the simple directions of the captain, that's going to change what you, and I don't care if you fished on a sport boat every single day for the last 42 years and you're going on another sport boat that you haven't been on before, then you're on a brand new boat. You don't know that guy. You want to though. And the captains are very approachable, but listen, we have choices today. You have choices. You can go and you can listen. A lot of the captains leave reports on websites like fish dope or nine, seven, six tuna. Listen to them. If everything that comes out of his mouth is negative, you probably don't want to go with him because he's a negative person, man. I'm telling you, nowadays, I don't understand how people can be negative. Be positive, but approach the captain. Listen to his plan. But if I'm going out on a sport boat in the next couple of weeks, I am going to go to the tackle store and I am going to buy me a couple flying fish because they're almost all the sport boats today have a rotation where you get to throw out a flying fish. Now, when it's your turn to send out the flying fish and they don't have very many left or the ones they have left aren't in very good shape. And you've built a relationship now because you talk to the crew like they're human beings. You didn't come in there dripping attitude. You said, Hey, skip. I got these bitching flying fish I bought at Hogan's Tackle. They're perfect. When it's my turn, can I fly one of my flying fish? There's a pretty good chance he's going to say yes if you talk to him throughout the day and weren't an asshole. But if, excuse me, sorry. But if I don't mean to cuss, now all the children that listen get free stuff from Captain Dave. That's how I do it at all my seminars. If I say a bad word, everybody gets free stuff. <laughs> but that being said, look at guys. These guys that are running these sport boats today are under a phenomenal amount of stress from the main reason for what we just went through. This global pandemic, it's pushed them back and now they're carrying half loads, okay? I'm sorry, my family owns nine sport boats in Dana Point, okay? Dana or sport fishing. My father's been in the business since 1947. Now I know there's a lot of you out there that have been doing it way longer than my dad but I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to you, the new guys that have been doing it for 40 or 50 years, not the guys that have been doing it for 70 or 80 years. You got to treat people with respect and you got to understand that these captains right now are going to give you the greatest 
trip of your life. But you got to understand too, they're still human beings at the end of the day. And they've gone through exactly the same thing that all of us have gone through. So be cool when you get on the boat, because it's not going to be like it was last year when you went on the boat. It's totally different. So they tell you to wear that mask, wear the God dang mask. Do exactly what you're told or don't go. If you don't, if you want to be a jerk, then don't go, please. We don't need you on no sport boat needs a jerk right now, but go on there, bring a couple flying fish in a little ice chest or somewhere, ask them, be cool. I don't know if they let you bring a little tiny ice chest on that would hold a couple of flyers. Some boats won't let you carry any ice chest. I'm not trying to tell you what to tell them. Be cool. Talk to them like human beings. Leave the flying fish in the car. Ask, hey, Skip, would it be okay if I brought out a couple flying fish and a little tiny ice chest that I'll keep in my bunk? You know, not that you're going to leave out on the deck, people trip over it or something, but just be cool. Talk to them like a man. Talk to them the way you want people to talk to you. Just because you paid your three or $400 to get on the boat doesn't mean you're the captain. He's the captain. He's got all the responsibility. He has to look good for all the people on the boat, not just you. So be cool. And I guarantee you it will change what your experience is. Well said, well said. And then speaking of your dad, your dad and Donna just said hi to you on Facebook. Just after Well, hello, Donna. Hello, dad. Yeah. Woohoo. Yeah. Love you guys. I'm glad you're here. Love my dad. What a... He's a legend, gang. If you don't know Donald K. Hansen, Google it. He's the reason why we all get to go do what we do. He is the reason. And then Dana Wharf Sport Fishing, my father ran it for a long, long time, but my little sister has moved it up to the next level. She has brought it way above. It's one of the premier landings on the California coast as far as customer service. You're not going to beat it anywhere. If you have children and you want to take them fishing or introduce them to that, Donna runs the most coolest kids camp on the planet. It's always sold out. But you know what? Any day of the week when you go out on a Dana Wharf sport fishing boat with your children, your children are going to get treated like kings. The service is unmatched up and down. the. Co I, I know there's a lot of good sport boats up and down the coast. But man, Donna and my dad focus on children. They know that's the future. So they sure do. And we're very grateful at CCA for those guys, for Dana Wharf Sport Fishing and all their friends and family there and their crew. We also did just get a, uh, another question. Great. I want to talk. Bait. Yeah. <laughs> in terms of live bait, when you're on a private boat, obviously live bait capacity is kind of limited. How do you manage that on the trip? And how do you know how much that you need that can fit in your bait tank? Okay, great question. There's a really, I know I'm going to keep jumping back. There's a really cool video I shot last year. I went with a guy on his 22 foot well craft or no. Oh my gosh. Well, I'll call it a well craft. I can't remember the name, but it's on there on my YouTube channel, your saltwater The boat held one scoop of bait and we put one and a half scoops of bait in there. We caught limits of yellowfin tuna on this little tiny boat with a scoop and a half of bait because we slowly loaded it. I told the guys at the bait barge, we didn't get there at six o'clock in the morning. We got there at about five. So there wasn't a big line. And I told them, please, can we load it light? And we loaded the bait light and we were able to stuff a bunch of bait in there. And then we were able, if you're going to fish for yellowfin, you're going to want to try to get as much small bait as you can. And right now, Mission Bay, Dana Point has that anchovy. I'll tell you what, I'll drive 20 miles on a boat to go get anchovies. It changes what you catch because you're able to chum. Then if you don't know how to cast, go get a little spinning rod or something so you can cast an anchovy. But if you have a bait tank full of anchovies and you chum that on that yellow fin, you're going to see the most unbelievable explosion behind the boat of yellowfin jumping out of the water. Now, if you're just going to go out there and you want that bluefin of a lifetime, then you're going to want to catch 10, 12, maybe a dozen, 15 mackerel. Forget about the sardines. Forget about the, the, the uh, anchovies. Put those mackerel in the bait tank. Get four or five, maybe six of those dead flyers. Put them in the freezer on your boat or put them in an ice chest with a lot of ice on it because 
You want to take a couple out and have them on the top of the ice. The rest you want to have buried under the ice so that they don't get thawed out in case you don't use them. So you can put them back in the freezer at $30 a clip. The reason I want to have some mackerel when I go out big bluefin fishing is because if I see a foamer of that big bluefin, I can cast a mackerel into it and they'll eat it almost every single time if I make the proper cast and drop a mackerel in a foamer. But if you mix sardines and anchovies with mackerel in the bait tank, if you don't have a split tank or a way to di divide them, then the mackerel will end up killing your sardines and your anchovies, and then you've got a bait tank full of dead bait. Another thing to remember in your bait tank game, you got to keep the dead bait out of the bait tank. Even one will affect the rest of your bait because the dead bait laying on the bottom of the tank leaves a toxin. If you set it, look at your bait tank. When there's dead bait on the bottom, you will notice that there's actually like an oil coming out of that bait laying on the bottom and it's oozing up to the top of the tank for lack of a better word. Well, that's poison. And that's going to start to kill all your bait. Now, if you have a bait tank and they told you, I'm sorry, I got a million things to say. If they got a bait tank and the bait company, the people that you bought it from says it holds three scoops, that doesn't mean it holds three scoops every time you go. That means that if the bait is in the best condition it possibly is, then you might be able to put three scoops. But I know nine out of 10 of those three scoop bait tanks hold two scoops, just because I know that. Here's the thing I teach every one of my clients. When you get to that bait barge in the morning, I don't care if you want 10 scoops or if you want one. When you pull up to that bait barge, you tell the guy at the bait barge, hey, I want a scoop. Look at that bait when you put it in your bait tank and see how it reacts to your bait tank. See how it reacts to the flow. Good bait's going to swim around in a circle and go down. Bad bait's going to be up on the top or bad water flow is going to be up on the top. Why do I say bad bait? Because when the season's going full bore, the bait company's catching bait 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and they're coming right in and they're dropping it in the bait barge and then they're going back out and they're catching it again and the bait doesn't have a chance to calm down. So it, not that the bait company doesn't handle it right, it just never has a chance to calm down in the bait receiver and then you throw it in your bait tank. So you want to look at the bait quality and then that will tell you how much you can put in your tank. So I always start with one scoop, look at it. If it's swimming good, I'll throw another scoop in Look at it. If it's swimming good, I might go for the third or maybe a half a scoop to top it off with. But it's all about bait quality and the size of your bait. Excellent. Excellent. And also, it probably it kind of matters at uh, the rate that you in which you load your bait as well. Some people, some boats like to load it really slow. Others like to do it fast. All Correct. Of and what I try to tell all my clients, and it, I got a video about it, Never go to the bait barge at six o'clock in the morning. I don't care if you're in Redondo, Marina del Rey, Dana Point, San Diego. Why? Because that's when all the sport boats are there. And that's when there's a line at the bait barge. And the bait guy at the bait barge, he's got to just throw that bait in your tank because there's another boat right behind you and another boat behind him and another boat. And so he's got to load it as quickly as he possibly can. If you could go at five or you could go at seven, guess what? There's a pretty good chance you're going to be one or two or three boats. And you can ask them very calmly and politely, hey, can we load the bait a little bit lighter today? That means not put as much in it. It's going to help the bait to live longer. And then this is the most important thing in the whole world. You have to tip the bait barge attendant. You have to. And if you don't think, oh, I'm going to sneak one by him today. If you don't have enough money in your wallet to tip the bait guy, then you probably don't have enough money to go fishing because you're going to see the attendant of the bait barge every single time you look in your bait tank. Every time you look in there, you're going to go, shit, I should have tipped him. Shit, it won't change your bait for the day, but it'll change the way he looks at you the next time you pull up. And they notice the tippers and they notice the non-tippers. And they all have a word for you non-tippers when you go up there. I don't know what code word they're using, but when there's two guys scooping, they have a code word they use for each other and they turn and they look 
and they look at the name of your boat and they look at you. So don't be that guy. I'm just trying to help. Absolutely. Well said. Dave, we have one more question from Steven here. Do you use a heavy duty snap swivel to attach your kite line and flyer line? If so, could you recommend a brand and a size? That's a great question. On the kite itself, we're using a very small swivel, a very small snap swivel going from the kite to the kite reel because it doesn't have any tension. All it has is the kite itself on it. So we're using a small one. It makes the kite fly better. I'm using the heaviest line I think I would fly on my kite itself is maybe 65 pound. I think I'm using 50 pound braid on my kite reel right now. I'd have to go upstairs and look, but 65 gonna be plenty heavy enough for the kite itself. As far as the reel goes, I use a, I overkill and you've seen it in my videos, gang. I use a 130 Makaira by Akuma, a 130. We use it with 40 pounds of drag and we use it with 200 pound braid because that's the heaviest line I can fly on the kite. If I could fly steel cable and use a winch, I would. Because remember what I told you 45 minutes ago, I flip and hate bluefin. I hate them more than anything. And when they bite my line, it's not a battle. Oh, I want to be a man and I want to be sore for a week. No, it's about killing it. The biggest one we caught was 309 pounds and we caught that thing in 17 minutes. And that's because it took that long to wind the line in. I never take the rod out of the rod holder. I kill the animal with the boat because I ditched school that day at San Clemente High School when they told us that fish were supposed to hurt us. I was like, I was absent that day. We're the dominant ones. We're supposed to kill them. That's me, only me. I know a lot of you want to show me what kind of a man you are by putting on a harness and fighting them in that. Have fun with that. Not me. I'm killing them with a 65-foot hatteras and 200 pound braid and 40 pounds of drag. Excellent, excellent. Well, Dave, believe it or not, I think we're at an hour. I know uh, you've, you've spoken with CCA before and I'm sure it won't be the last, but you're all over Facebook, you're all over the internet, but how do we get in touch with you? How do we find- Hey, I got the most incredible website. If you enjoyed any of this at all, this is me. Every day, all day, everywhere I go, I'm super approachable. But you can look at me on Facebook Live every day. Dave Hansen, I do a live show every single day on there. I do story time at night, telling you stories about the crazy stuff I did when I was a kid. And then you can go to my website at yoursaltwaterguide.com. If you're tired of sucking at fishing and you don't want to suck anymore, go to my website. But if you want to suck, do not go to my website because you will be successful every time you go. And that will, if that's not your, if you don't want to, don't go there. And if you have to ask somebody if it's okay to spend $4.99, then you probably shouldn't go fishing. All right. If, I can't even imagine having to ask, hey, Kelly, can I spend $5? Wow. We're getting a divorce. <laughs> Awesome, Dave. Well, thank you again so much for being with us this afternoon. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much, gang. Thanks for letting me be here. Thanks. I had a good time. Absolutely. And guys on Facebook, don't forget, we also have a day on the Bay with CCA uh, this weekend on Saturday, starting at 7 a.m. in Mission Bay. We do have registration still up, but you have to register by tomorrow. We're asking anyone with a kayak, boat, float tube, anything that floats to come out fishing with us on Mission Bay. Again, you have to register ahead of time by tomorrow, but we'll be there on Saturday at 7 a.m. starting that. But uh, yeah, you can register on ccacalifornia.org for that. And then on the weekend following, we also have the 2020 Calibid Challenge put on by the Channel Islands chapter. So stay tuned for that. That's June 20th, and you can actually register for that as well. But Again, this is Chris from CCA California. That's Dave Hansen. Thank you so much for joining us and we'll talk to everyone soon.